everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Two Catholic Dudes. My name is Ryan Klaus. My name is Danny Cleary. And as always, we're not priests, we're not theologians, we're just two Catholic dudes, and we're talking about our faith. And today we are very excited. We are doing our first remote guest on the podcast. Second, uh, second. But se- like- oh, second. Excuse me, second. But this one is uh, where we're together. That's right. And they're remote. Um, yeah. We have Edmund Mitchell on the podcast. He is a director of evangelization. Uh, he has two podcasts of his own, the Catholic Youth Ministry Podcast and the show. Uh, thank you so much for being on, brother. Great to have you. Dude, I'm so pumped. I'm so pumped. You guys are so sweet. I just like commented a joke because you guys said, who should we have on the podcast? And I said, me. <laughs> and, and then and then look, here we are. It we worked. It so happen. guys, persistence is key. <laughs> yeah. Persistence. You got to manifest things into the world. Well, it just I don't believe shows that. how desperate we were for guests. We were just like the, <laughs> the first person that commented. We were like, okay, well, message him. <laughs> so anyone listening, that's all, you gotta do. Sure. that's all you got to do to be on the show is just put a dumb yeah. comment and you're on. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, no, no, no. So we've we've been a podcast for like a year, and you've been more than that, right? How long have you? I mean, yeah. I mean, well, uh, man, like back in two thousand, I think thirteen or twelve. You know, like every upper middle class white dude with a friend <laughs> who is, you know, twenty five. <laughs> we're like, people want to listen to us talk. And so me and my friend Chris were just I think at one point it was called um Between the Pint and the Cross from the GK Chesterton quote. And we just talked about whatever. Like we just uh, kinda uh and so I've always experimented with failing podcasts. It's kind of my hobby is to just start a podcast no one listens to and then move on to another we're one. We're gonna talk about and the the maybe the reason but like the purpose of that but i was gonna say like we've only been doing this for a year but you were one of the first ones that we saw because we jumped into instagram social media catholic world and you popped up right away and we're like oh man this guy's doing some great stuff you know you might say that nobody watches or listens but i'm sure they do and but your production quality and i i have an eye for production and and like i've always continued to try to step it up over the year and i was like man he's doing it right he's doing it well you know and you see a lot of like not just in the Catholic world, but people who do podcasts, and it's like mm, this is kind of janky. Well, something I noticed is that you also that, that's that's what that's what made me start following you guys was the production quality. I was uh, like, yeah, yes, right. like finally someone gets it. Someone, someone like you know gets well, it. Well, and that's the point of like uh, is that you also had the video game going because a lot of podcasts it's like audio only, and I always uh, get on Ryan's case because he puts so much work into our video quality, and it, I, I mean clearly since what you just said it worked out. So he put so yeah. much. Uh, focus on that and I always go like 80% of the people just listen to this and nobody will ever see how great this shot looks but Dude, it's for the it's for the micro content yeah, right? Right. like right. I think you had I think you guys had had very sweetly said that you never listen to the show you've only watched it on Instagram yeah, right. you're absolutely <laughs> right, right. So, yeah and I, no, no no but that's but that's great I mean there's plenty of people that that's it you know like and there's people I follow it's like Oh, I just I just watched the funny clips, you right. know. Yeah, totally. exactly. So I, I said that I was like, "Hey, let's have you on the show." But full disclaimer, never heard it, and you said the same thing. <laughs> but so many people, it's tough. I get it. I don't want to listen to most hour long podcasts. The, the, you know, yeah. the, they don't. Have, people don't have the time it, for it, but they want to consume little bite sized things, and that's why Instagram is so great. Is yeah. yeah, and it depends too. Like I, I don't really believe in the whole like uh, like when people ask, you know, hey, I want to start a podcast. How long should it be? I always say as long as it needs to right. be. I mean, you could do a five minute daily news show, or you could do a four hour Joe Rogan podcast. I think you just it's whatever it needs to be, and I think anyone that says. Um, you know, a creative media needs to be a certain way. I don't, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. Right. It's like, whatever you want to do, you're going to find people or attract people that are into that. Right? Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Cause that was something that we struggled with for a long time is we would go, how long is it? Is it too long? Is it too short? Because some of our episodes go very long, somewhere more around 30 minutes or so. And we had a couple of our listeners that were just like, Whatever, whatever it is, it is. You yeah, know? we try to put ourselves in a box yeah. at the beginning. We can't go over thirty minutes. It's like, well, we have more to say than that usually. Yeah. You so, know. yeah, and I and I get the vibe from you guys that you guys aren't, you know, you guys aren't in this for like you aren't trying to like you are intentional about it, but you're not like, hey, what's what's like mass population target audience so that we can reach a certain level or blah blah blah. Like, I get the feeling that you're kind of like me you're in this for the long haul Mm -hmm. and so you're like i'm just gonna keep doing this and you attract people that are into whatever you're doing and you kind of as you're putting out stuff you're making curated decisions about 
the type of people you're attracting or the people that you want to hang out with or talk to or communicate with. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's really smart. 100%. It's that authentic that the authenticity authenticity that you you're not trying to just create a business because the, being a catholic speaker being a catholic podcaster being in ministry it's much more than that you know you're doing it for uh for the 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 reasons of evangelization first right. and foremost and the, the only reason that we want to continue to grow is because you can reach and you can evangelize more people right you know we know yeah, we're, we're probably sure. not gonna be millionaires doing this you probably think <laughs> what you're a smart guy you're probably <laughs> thinking the same but um <laughs> Yeah, you know, we'd be in a different business if we were trying to achieve that. But and it's not about it's about For talking sure. about the things that that we feel that speak to us, and hopefully they speak to other people. Like, and I think that there's something to be said about not just going to whatever uh, hot button thing you can talk about all the time. Sometimes you got to address those, but most of the time on our show and from what I've listened to uh, of your stuff, it's more what you think you can speak to with uh, with truth. Uh, and with uh, yeah. the ability to, to give knowledge and, and help to other people, so you speak to that. You're, no one's trying to be anything yeah. that they're not. We're just we're just two Catholic dudes. And that's well, it. and this yeah, and there's and there's that's what I love about you know your show. Like it's just hey, this is just us, and it's our perspective on on the faith. And there are different types of shows for different things. Like um, you know, in my day job, my full time job, I work at a parish, and everything is much more explicitly teaching doctrine catechesis right. and then i have a podcast that's so we have our parish podcast then we have i have a um, catholic youth ministry podcast which is teaching mm -hmm. and it's much more like how do i teach something it's scripted and then i just have the show where i mean <laughs> i literally had a guy uh dm me one time and say hey man i'd listen to your show more if i knew there was actually going to be serious stuff in it <laughs> and i was like i was like dude then don't listen to my show. Yeah, <laughs> I just was like, get out. It's you know, not, yeah. He was just like, There's well, other podcast for that. He was just like, and 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 uh, honestly, I was a little hurt by. It. He was like, he, he said, um, well, surely you talk about you know something of substance throughout the show. And I literally DM'd him like, not really. <laughs> like, if we do, we do. But um, you know, we've gone five, ten episodes just messing around with me, Ali, Johnny, and Nick. And for me, when I was younger. I mean, you have so many YouTube celebrities, you have all these different people in the media, in social media. When I was a young kid, I would have loved to just, I mean, there's there's place for Scott Hahn and Jeff Cavins and the father Mike Schmitz right. and the instruction, but there's also a place for, like, I just wanted to listen to some people that seemed normal and not, not of the world, but just seemed like they had a personality, Dude, you right. know, and then who happened to be Catholic, you are right? And then just the like, oh wow, that guy's Catholic. Hundred yeah. percent. You just basically read the script of when Ryan and I were like, let's start a podcast. <laughs> you just read off yeah. what we what yeah. we thought about. How, yeah. how crazy! That's Showing awesome. the world That's that awesome. like you can be super Catholic, but you don't have to be a hundred percent, you know, catechetical and like all. You don't we're have just, to know yeah. everything. You don't have to have all the answers. You can just be authentic in your faith. And live that out in whatever means. And if it's by, I want to do a podcast because I want to share with people what I feel and my love for my faith, that's beautiful. And even if you do, like you said, you do a yeah, whole dude, episode where you're not even talking about anything on the faith, but you're still living that example of a good Catholic man yes. in your discussion with your friends. Of course. And I think that's really comforting for people yeah. to listen to, to watch. To, to watch. Uh, you're like, oh my gosh, they, they're just regular people, but they're still, there's something about them. There's something that's true, truly Catholic that I'm watching these people and I'm feeling it. And so it's a great example that, you know, because yeah, the people that have all the catechetical stuff on YouTube, it's great, but like they still have to go to the store and they still have to have regular interaction actions with people they, they they do normal day stuff and like how do we live our catholic faith in those situations and i think that's what our shows speak to well and and it's a very you know saint paul said i fill up what is like in my flesh i'm filling up what is lacking in christ's affliction and the question there is like well what's lacking in christ's affliction what's lacking in christ's affliction is is saint paul's contribution like saint paul participating what's lacking is saint paul being a part of that suffering right and the same with the catechism or with our faith like like we participate in the incarnational reality of god like god became a person and so now we're we're an i'm an edmund version of jesus like and you're a ryan and danny version of jesus and that's what's missing in the church is all of our individual incarnations of I, I used to be really big about the the catechism i used to like do this whole thing a website all this stuff and um 
you know, in the early church, you a lot of before the printing press, like a lot of people weren't necessarily reading. So you had to see the catechism. You had to see the teachings of the church in the church. So like the church taught like signs and symbols and numbers, like seven sacraments seen as seven pillars or so they, the church became like an incarnation of what we believe the doctrine. And I think it's the same with our, with our lives, with our, like we're a catechism, we're a walking catechism. Uh, in flesh, right? We're in fleshing doctrine in our daily lives. Even if that means I'm freaking cleaning poop off of a window <laughs> at my house because my kids have gone crazy. <laughs> like that's, that's me incarnating, you know, doctrine. Yeah, I, I could not agree more with everything you just said. That is absolutely how I think that we live our ministry, live our life. It, it's, it's crazy how like-minded this conversation has been so yeah. far. Really, really. I, I couldn't agree more with that. I specifically didn't talk during that whole little moment that you had because that right there is that Instagram soundbite that people need to hear, yeah, right? That, that was <laughs> there's the clip. But, uh, there's the clip. Yeah. Jamie, yeah, I it, think, uh, the clip. we can be done now. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, but hey, go, go ahead. Uh, uh, a word that you use that I want to touch on because I've used it a lot on our show is uh, participating and 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 Saint Paul being being involved in in that. Because I think that that's the thing that a lot of us miss is we think we can just go to church and sit there and be like, okay, cool, God, take care of my life. And there's no participation from us. Like I, I said before that sometimes when we pray, we pray for something, we just think God's going to make it happen for us instead of actively participating in making that happen in our life and going out and searching for where God is answering our prayers, where God is active in our life. And I think it's going out and living as that... Uh, as you said, that's a huge part of it, and I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, right, faith, we're getting off the rails really works. quick, but we we always do this. We have two questions that we oh, ask every it. guest, <laughs> and we forget almost every time. <laughs> we're like every guest we do this. And then I we even don't. said it before. I, I told him. I prepped him. <laughs> uh, okay, so the, so one question we ask at the beginning of every episode is: What is the most crazy wacky authentically unique thing that's ever happened to you at mass that you can remember remember right now so i have five kids so crazy wacky things happen every time every time mass. <laughs> but but one uh one time in particular i think um we try to you know kind of talk to them a little bit uh especially when they're younger um during the consecration of the eucharist and kind of say like hey you know pay attention yeah, to this this right. is important um and my son Noah, I think he was, or no, I think it was Elijah. He was um, maybe only three or four. And right as you know, consecration starts happening. I'm kind of like, you know, getting down closer to him. I'm like, hey, do you see that up there? Uh, that's Jesus. And he says, what? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that that's Jesus. I'm like whispering, trying to keep right. his voice quiet. I'm like, yeah. That's Jesus. And then really loud, right as the priest holds it up and right after the ringing of the bell. So it's completely <laughs> silent. And we're in the front row, nice. which life hack, life hack, if you have lots of little kids, if you bring them to the front row, you would think that's the worst place, but it's like easier for them to, they just see everything up close. They're way more like engaged. Huh. Pro tip so right Noah, there, guys, or, listening or, at home. Pro tip, heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> so Elijah or whoever, one of my kids, uh, <laughs> Right, Are they all biblical right as the names? Priest is holding, uh, kind of. Well, Katiri is a saint. Yeah, yeah, saint yeah. Katiri. It's and, not Katiri. Uh, Ignatius. Ignatius isn't biblical. That's uh, that's um, uh, that's a saint. Yeah. And then uh, Ignatius, Dominic, Noah, Elijah. So, anyways, what was I talking so, about? Okay. Oh, holding mass. up, holding up. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so so the priest is holding up the Eucharist, completely silent and out loud, like he's upset at me. He's just like, he's just like, that's not Jesus. You're tricking me. <laughs> Everyone at church knows I work at the church. I'm in charge of catechesis. I'm the youth minister, and my kid is like, that's not Jesus. You're tricking me. Like. It was, oh, it was man. one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. I think the priest smiled. Did people laugh? You know, I think he kind of like smiled a little bit. Was it, was it like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How did they know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. were, <laughs> wow. Yeah, people were laughing. 
Uh, yeah, we we got out of there pretty quick. We might have pulled a Judas and got out of there after communion. <laughs> Just joking. You're tricking. There, okay, that, it's it's funny, but we we've talked about it before. I, I think it was on Tyler's episode, like way back at the beginning of the year or beginning of our season. It's like kids running around at mass, kids screaming, like babies crying. Yeah. And yeah. young, you know, toddlers or however young your kid was saying, saying funny stuff. You know, it's it's distracting sometimes. It's it's crazy. It's funny, but it's a sign that our church is growing. And oh yeah, for sure. Be, you know, for f- sure. You yeah. said five kids you got. God bless yeah. you, first yeah. of all. Oh my gosh. But like, I'm sure it's a challenge. And all legit too. No, no high school pregnancies. All after the <laughs> sacrament. I know I look twelve. But <laughs> they're all. They're all but they're I, all legit, and they're all I I can't speak. They're, they're all like they're all like they're all like seven months apart too. We don't know how it happened. It's just like <laughs> God bless somehow you. Somehow it worked. Oh my gosh! But yeah. I can't speak from experience. But I'm sure it's a challenge every single time you bring them to mass. It's just like you know what? Honestly, honestly, uh, if you beat them enough before they turn four, <laughs> they're good during mass. No, uh, no, actually, they're pretty. They're pretty good. Um, in fact, actually, what ended up happening is that what started becoming kind of frustrating in a weird way was the number of people that would come up after mass and be like, you're doing a great job. Because like, like our family is such a spectacle because there's so many right. of us uh, that we take up a whole pew that like, I mean, it, I don't know. It felt kind of it felt kind of weird. There was like so many people would just kind of like make sure to come out of their way. And at first it's like, OK, thank you. But after a few weeks of that, it's kind of like, all right, everyone, line up and make sure you come and tell us how good of a job we're doing. It starts feeling a little patronizing, right? It's like, do you really mean this? It it could be like, why are you still surprised? Why do you keep telling me I'm doing a great job? Like, is this is this a shocker to you? Are we? Yeah, they're like, your kids are so good during that. We're like, why are you saying it like that? (laughs) We know. Yeah, I mean, but good on you guys. That's that's really that's really great. And uh, the bottom line, yeah, it's it's showing that the church is growing in those funny moments in the annoying moments with the crying with kids running around but yeah. it's still a beautiful thing in in the end so so moving on to uh th- that would probably one of the funniest <laughs> questions that we've ever had answered but uh so you said that you well, i'm trying to be your best <laughs> guest i'm trying to be your best guest ever <laughs> we're gonna have guests of the year that's gonna be the competition right guests yeah, of we, the year. we we're do an award ceremony at the end this we'll is post our, it on instagram this is our year of lists we're, do, we're trying to we're trying to do lists this year a lot so okay. yeah we'll have the top right. the top x amount of guests and uh you're in the running but like okay. you know there's there's yes. still a lot of time left yeah, in the you're, the you're the first guest of season two you so. got plenty of time to blow it Whew. all but, right no pressure but so all get right, on, on to that half. point so what got you started you said that you're the director of evangelization at your parish you, i also work at we both of us work at a parish so we all are familiar with that parish life and how different it can be from yeah. the podcast uh you know personality life but what drew you to working in ministry? Because obviously it wasn't the money. Obviously it's yeah. not, you know, beca- it, it's, it takes a special person, I always say, to work, especially in youth ministry. So what <laughs> drew you to doing a that? Special, a real special person. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this gets into my testimony a little bit of how I met uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's hear for it. Your yeah, let's hear it. Who've never heard about him. But... Um, so I grew up, I grew up like a normal upper middle class suburban white kid in Florida. Well, my parents moved around. We moved around a lot before fifth grade because my dad was in the military, and my parents got pretty involved in their faith. Uh, I think around when I was in fifth or sixth grade, um, but I had a lot of experiences of. Uh, for a few years, we lived in Germany, um, and we pilgrimaged around like all these Catholic places, and we would go with this big Catholic family who was very, very faithful. I used to hate driving it. We would caravan two separate vans and I used to hate driving in their van because they would say, Oh dude, they were like every single rosary. Like they, <laughs> they would say all of the, and I'm a little kid. I just want to play. Yeah. Games, right, yeah. you know? I just want to play like ga- game, boy. game boy. And they were saying, I mean, before, before was it JP two added another, they were adding, they were probably adding more as well. Like they just would pray all of them. <laughs> so anyways, that was a very, that was a very influential, um, you know, experience, but I would say like, I didn't have the language of a personal relationship with Jesus, like an intentional personal relationship I mean, with Jesus. I didn't have how that many language. of us at that age did, I, right? I do. Yeah, exactly. Like, so I will say I had some level of faith in a personal relationship, but it wasn't until 
uh, I was in high school and I was dating a Protestant and I think it was either nice. Scott Hahn or Jeff Cavins came to our parish, really small parish in Florida. And my dad buys wow. Rome Sweet Home and hands it to me and says, give this to your girlfriend. Right. It was like a good, <laughs> you know, it was it was well intentioned, but he was like, sure. your girlfriend might be interested in this. And I was so impressed by, I think it was Jeff Cavins as well, who it was the first time that I met a non, that I saw a non priest who knew a ton about the faith and just seemed different, just seemed, he was Catholic, he was faithful and he was smart. And so, um, that really started this long journey that I'll try to try to truncate, but, uh, it wasn't a, t so I, I went to college to Georgia tech for biomedical engineering. Cause I wanted to be smart and rich. Uh, and, or I wanted people to think I was smart right. and rich. And that day when my dad handed me that book, uh, I read half of it in the parking lot and finished it that day. And I started like a lot of people, you know, I read every single Scott Hahn book. And even when I was at Georgia tech, uh, I was just like, I think I want to do ministry. I was, I was so involved at the Catholic center. We a long story about doing ministry there. And eventually I got to the point where I just had to be honest that being a volunteer was not, it just wasn't going to be enough for me. I wanted to be in a parish. I wanted to be in ministry. And so I called Franciscan University, called the uh, admissions counselor, and I said, hi, um, I think I want to be Scott Hahn. And then he <laughs> laughed. He said, that's not a career path. <laughs> I said, you know, like travel around, do ministry, write books, you know. And uh, he told me about the catechetics program and the youth ministry concentration. And I was like, oh, that's definitely. So that's when I started really falling in love and believing in parish ministry. And that's really when I felt like the Lord just grabbed me by the collar and and just, I mean, I, I hope and pray to never leave parish ministry. I, I My heart is just like the Lord just has me and I just believe so much in the parishes the parish as the front lines of evangelization of, you know, I don't want to go up to a diocesan position. I don't want to go to a big Catholic company. I don't want to do this full time. I want to be in a parish helping in ministry, helping change a culture. That's not just about my personality, but that's like a culture of, a, a, of a parish. You know? This is absolutely crazy. Edmund talking to you because it kind of feels like I'm talking to the mirror in the morning when I wake up because we have such similar like ways that because we're both so attractive, <laughs> <laughs> but we just like everything that you're saying, I'm hanging on every word of, of your testimony because I, I can relate so much to that as someone that wanted to be in ministry so bad. And I wanted to be in parish youth ministry. I didn't want, I, all I wanted to do was help the parish and the culture of the youth group of the parish at large know and grow deeper in faith with with the lord and i i i'm everything that you're saying is so beautiful and i think so necessary and people think that sometimes it's the big speakers and whereas the big speakers kind of impacted you in your life it's the really the parish people the people that are in the parish that really spread the faith to the people that may never encounter those large gather those large speakers those large events but parish ministry people that kind of meet the people that you never know what seeds you're planting. Those are the most, those are important people in evangelization that you're speaking to. I think it's really, really important. Yeah, it, and I was very impacted by, you know, like the story of Father Mike Scanlon in Franciscan University. You know, I mean, you could argue that Father Mike Scanlon was and is very much a personality at the campus. But when you get to Franciscan, I remember this when I was at, Fran when I went to visit Franciscan and I went to daily mass, I noticed that every single person stayed kneeling once the priest was done, like clearing off the altar and went back to his chair. Everyone stayed kneeling. And, I, you know, for me growing up, like that was the time when you ask your dad if we're going to go to Blockbuster. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. Yes, right? Block like, that's, how's my, how did <laughs> you get a behavior like, check in with your parents at that point? Yeah. 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 It's like, it's like the real halftime, you know, like a little break there. You're like, all right, cool. Let's let the, let's let the priest catch his breath and then we'll start back up. And, uh, I noticed that everyone stayed kneeling. And so I go to sit back down and I'm like, well, wait, what, you know, so I kneel back down and I realized everyone's just praying. Everyone just stayed praying. And that moment right there stuck with me as an example of culture, culture shift. 
because no one, no, there was no sign that said stay kneeling right. after, you know, there was no sign. It was the culture supported the fact that everyone was chasing after a relationship with Jesus Christ through prayer. And it changed everyone. Everyone at that mass stayed kneeling. No one had to say it. No one taught it. And I, it changed me for the rest of my mm. life. You know, I see other people sitting down. I'm like, no, no, like, let's, like, we're praying. We just received Jesus. Like, let's keep Dude, you're just praying. You're just, like, that's what the priest is You're doing. just hitting it out of the park. We're, yeah. we're probably going to have a whole episode on the real presence of the Eucharist, like often Bishop Barron talks about. We saw his talk at, yeah. at RE Congress right before COVID yeah. shut everything down. But... Uh, I think so much of it comes down to the culture of a particular parish uh, uh, where yeah. if you if you yeah. really believe that, that Jesus is there, you would do these certain things and some parishes might be missing that. And so that's I love that. I, I think it's deeper because oh. culture is like it can be for youth ministry. It can be a culture of how you do a retreat, culture of how you do religious education. Culture is everything. So go, what were you saying? Well, well, what I was going to say, the, the reason I was bringing that up is Father Mike Scanlon I believe is responsible for that culture. But when you walked, Father Mike Scanlon didn't have to get up and give a big, I mean, maybe he did give a homily about it. Who knows? But the the point that it impressed on me was that someone at this university had created a culture shift that was bigger than any one personality. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and it really started clearing up like, oh, I need to be Scott Hahn or I need to be Jeff Cavins. It was like, no, 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 I need to, I, I like, I want to have the type of impact where people start forgetting where this even started. They just say that parish is different. Jesus is there. Something's different about those people. I wow. We are gonna get dive deep into that. We're gonna take a quick break for our, let our cameras reset. But I'm loving everything that's being said right now. Let's take a quick break. All right, we're back. I just uh, you guys have been rolling through so amazingly, and it's sometimes it's nice not to uh, have to. <laughs> Ryan, you know, you uh, but anyways, I, I normally the derailer, and Danny's normally. I, I am always the derailer. One hundred thousand percent, he is the derailer. <laughs> He's and just so feeling I just the like Lord. Kind of He's just feeling the fire. <laughs> I'm just taking he, my hands off the wheel. This He's episode, patiently you guys waiting go. for a chance to just jerk the wheel. <laughs> Jesus, no, no, take I have a wheel. point. I've been waiting to make this point. Uh, you said that you wanted to be Scott Hahn. You know, kind of jokingly, but like that's you wanted to take that career path yeah. of like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna do what Scott Hahn did. Um, but I'm sure you had other inspirations. Like you, you said, there was a, a father, uh, father who. Uh, so Father Father, Father Stan Michael Scanlon from Franciscan University. Scanlon, yeah. right. But I'm sure that you had an amalgamation of uh, people that inspired you in your faith that you kind of wanted to take that path. But Scott Hahn was the biggest one, right? Yeah. And you're like, I want to be Scott Hahn. But God said, no, 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 no. You are Edmund Mitchell, and I have a special path for you. Yeah. And so, but what you can do is take that inspiration from all of those sources and kind of create who you are. So I, I always bring it back to music analogies because that's what I do. That's my passion. Yeah, yeah. That's that's how God spoke to me first. But when I learned to play the guitar, I, you know, I wanted to be, for, for me, it was like, I wanted to play like Metallica, right? And that was my inspiration. It was like heavy metal. And then I moved into like pop punk and I was taking inspiration from like Blink-182 and then I got into John Mayer, et cetera, et cetera. But what happened is after, you know, so much time really diving into each of those those categories, each of those those artists, I found who I was and I found my voice in the end, in the long run. Yeah. And so the same thing is we, you take inspiration in your faith from all of these mentors, all you read all these books of different people who've written them. And what again, you became Edmund Mitchell, the, the Catholic podcaster, the youth minister, and you found your way to speak and your way to reach people. Yeah. Unique to you, but inspired directly inspired by those heroes in your life. Yeah, I sound amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, something that, that you brought up that I want to I want to go back to, because I think that all of us in our different ministry facets can kind of relate to it. And it's you wanted to create a culture where people didn't even know where it came from. Yeah. And I think that that's so important, and especially in youth ministry, uh, because I, I, I've always told uh, the young people or anybody that I because, you know, when you're in youth ministry, a lot of the times people at the parish will come up and they'll be like, hey, you know, you're everything's so great. Youth ministry is so great. I would rather that the young people know that Jesus is incredible mm. rather than think that their youth minister is incredible. Or I'd rather the parish think the youth ministry program is thriving, not the youth minister is really great. Yeah, I, you know, and I think that that I, to 100 percent. I 100 percent agree. I think uh, even as a father, you know, I hope my kids don't think back. Uh, I, I think I would love to be the type of father that when my kids are grown up and they're thinking 
dad used to say that it's followed yeah. by Jesus used to say. Dad used to say Jesus used to say. Or, or dad used yeah. to say Jesus says. Dad, yeah. dad right. told us Jesus said whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. It's the whole John the Baptist argument. It's it's Everyone says, oh, man, you're the guy. You're the guy. You're a great speaker. Yeah. You're, you're so uh, eloquent. You're, we want to all follow you. And he says, no, it's not about me. Check out this dude. And I think yeah. it's easy this to fall into man. that, too, when you're in ministry as you look at other people's. I, I remember all the time, like, I'd go to, you know, it's fun as a youth minister to go to these conferences. You see all your youth ministry friends yep. or all these different people. And people um, would see me doing stuff on social media, and they'd come up to me and be like, oh, man, you're really crushing it in ministry out in, out in wherever. And I would just be like, dude, you have no idea what type of ministry I'm doing. Like, you don't, like, you have no clue. Don't get fooled by what you're seeing online. You you don't know what I'm doing at all, man. Like this it's is all just, just smoke and mirrors. Yeah, here. yeah. Like <laughs> this isn't. Re- but like, I mean, and it could be a sign of good things. It could be not as you know, like you don't know what's going on in someone's heart. Just as like in catechesis, like you have no, there's no telling. You know, like there's no telling. Like like God uses, <laughs> yeah, God uses, you know, mysterious and wonderful ways to to change people's hearts, and it's very hard to tell. That's one of the biggest problems in ministry is trying to figure out how do you measure fruitfulness. There's a whole other episode we're going to hit on. For sure. Yep. Is a Catholic influencers, social media people, and auth- real authentic people or not. And it's hard to tell because sometimes, I mean, like, look, we, we both have awesome productions here going on. And yeah. maybe we're just hiding behind that and trying to reach people. I don't want to waste that topic on this episode because it's a whole episode I'll in be itself. back. I'm back. But, I'm coming for the yeah. strap. Dude, he's coming for the belt. <laughs> But I, I, I really, to your point, I think that that's, that's really true about not knowing what's going on because I think that a lot of people in ministry too kind of struggle with what you put out for everyone to see is very different than what you could be dealing with in your heart. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's something that um, in ministry that, that's really hard is, is – and people forget when you're in a ministry job that – Yes, it's your job, but your relationship with Jesus and how you live your life is more important than how you do your job. Because yeah. how if you if your heart is for God and you're living your life the way that you're called to, that will reflect in your job. Yeah. But if you're just doing your job, pretend, and then when your job is over, or when you clock out, you're not living the way that God's calling you to. Com- th- you have to do it in the opposite order. You yeah, have man. to have your faith right first. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the big things. I mean, that that's where I think it's kind of a little V vocation in the sense that like it's not it's I mean, honestly, I, I know people who work in parish ministry and it's a job. I mean, it's a it's a clock in, totally. clock out. And um dude, it'll chew you up and spit you out. Like it has to be it has to be now I'm not saying you have to be um imprudent and unbalanced when it comes to boundaries about your day you like your work life and your family life but it has it just has to be more than a nine to five it, ha- it like i think from my perspective i think 100 couldn't, couldn't agree yeah couldn't agree more uh and i think that, that a lot of times too people will forget in ministry and, and you mentioned it on one of your sound bites i was watching earlier is that sometimes being in ministry is yes you may be the youth minister you may be the music minister you may be the director of the bulletin handing out. I don't know if that's a job. That's sure. but, that's, um, that is now. <laughs> uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that's not a, that's not the box you should live in in parish ministry because you never know where you're going to need. Especially we talk now a lot about the pandemic and situation. I don't know how it is uh, where you're living, but in California, it is a disaster. Yeah. And mass is outside. We're constantly having to make a bunch of different adaptations. And I haven't been able to meet and gather youth ministry in six months. Yeah, it's But rough. I've become an audio technician and having to sacristan for outside and learning all that because I'm still... Dude, I'm still the parish minister. I'm still one of the ministers of this parish and wanting to make sure that the parish yeah, yeah. gets, Thrives, gets right. Jesus. Yeah. It's beyond gets, your job of youth ministry. Exactly. I've never once in my life got the chance to ring the bells. You do that now. I'm doing everything now. It's <laughs> like, yeah, it, we're, we're we're on skeleton crew. So right. I'm playing music. I'm doing I'm I'm mixing. We're playing mass outside or we're doing I'm playing mass outside. We're doing mass outside. Uh this one, this one mass, I realized the bells were still inside in the sacristy, and we're outdoor, we're outdoor mass. I'm playing. She just, just with, whistled. We're, right. No, no, no. <laughs> it's where I, I play an acoustic guitar, and everyone's. We have a big tent out there. Everyone's sitting down, and we get to the uh, the the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer, and I was like, oh shoot, the bells are inside, but I should run and grab those. So I run in. 
uh, I, I grab my keys, run in the church, get in the sacristy, grab the bells. I run out. They're they're jangling the whole time. <laughs> I, I have to quiet them as I open the door because like everyone will hear them. As soon as I open the door, he's literally elevating the host, and I and I'm walking out and ringing the bells. Like that. <laughs> you gave it a little but twist. So, you gave it a little hey. Yeah, I did. The bells are here. Uh, just just throw them and let them ring yeah. as they fly. Someone, like, I got the bells. You guys, but, someone who so was their first time there at the Paris, they were like, "That guy's a little over the top." <laughs> Um, but I was excited. I've, 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 I've got like a new technique. I, the first one I was like, Oh, I don't know. Should I do it? Like a Dude, bit? you need is to get, a, you need to get it... a rope like that goes from the bells all the way over to where you like play piano and have it like on your foot or something. You on can, my like, foot. Yeah. yeah. Like, just have one of the keys. You don't, you be the bells. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, yeah, just, yeah. So it just pulls. Guys, yeah. we are, we are thinking outside the box right now, <laughs> but so th that's what Danny's getting at is like uh, being able to adapt and, ch and take on new roles in the parish, especially when we're like on totally on skeleton crew during COVID. COVID yeah. because it's more about your position that you're hired for. It's making the church, helping the church thrive. And yeah. I think it goes back to talking about culture is, is if you have a culture where your, your ministry, the parish staff and ministry is willing to go above and beyond to help, then that example will inspire the example of whoever your volunteers are in your ministry or whoever else to create a culture of this parish steps up and helps each other. Yeah. Whenever, whenever people need help, you step up and help. Well, the big, and the, I think that the that's, big, yeah, the big, a lot of the struggle with a lot of parishes is, is the silos that are created where everyone's just kind of working in their own silo. And that has a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for that. That could be a whole podcast episode. And that, I, that alone yeah. is, I think the work of amazing parish is to try to help organizational help or organizational health become a thing at, yeah. at parishes. And really the more and more I've worked for the church, I've realized that organizational health is the big problem at most parishes pastors just don't realize like a lot of pastors a lot of priests love jesus and they became a priest to 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 like to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass to pastor right. people to to sit next to them on their deathbed to to heal their or to forgive their sins on behalf of christ in confession but then they're literally put in the CEO role of a, of a multi-million budget or whatever, a couple hundred thousand yeah. dollar budget organization is, with right. 20 people on staff and they're trying to just be a priest. And they, they, yeah. I mean, the number of priests that I know when, when I asked them, like, I, I, I worked for a pastor who said he, he was kind of lamenting. He's like, you know, I was in seminary for a very, very long time, you know, for a long time, not a very, very, but he's like, I was in seminary for a long time. And it's like seven or eight years. He's like, usually. he's like, I had zero, zero, uh, training in how to budget business skills, how to right? budget yeah. a financial budget. And he's like, I'm making decisions for a, for like a 800,000, $900,000 budget and like 30, right. 30 year loans and like all this stuff. He's like. I, it's nuts. He's dude. like, this he's, is a whole nother episode as yeah, well. Like, we yeah. want, I want to have you back, and we we dive in like deep into this because that's a huge, oh, dude, that's a huge, huge issue in our church. I, I right? really think, it's, I really it's think, huge. amazing. I really think, amazing parish. That type of amazing parish divine renovation are going to be the next generation of most the parishes that get organizational health down right. They're going to, especially during COVID, they're going to be far and above all the other parishes. And people are going to go, what's going on with this parish? And it's going to be the organizational yeah. health. Well, and I think that especially now with COVID, as you were saying, like a lot of parishes that realized they didn't have really smart financial planning or they didn't really have the experience, they're going, oh, no, we're in huge trouble. And that's why there's, you're seeing massive layoffs or massive ministry cuts and all kinds of different things because the parishes were so unprepared. Well, yeah, and, and the, it's, the well, priests were unprepared. And it's all of it's all of it for me. I, I mean, I'm very vision minded. That's kind of my personality to a fault. But it all comes down to a vision problem because if you have silos at a parish, that means everyone has a different vision of what the church is. And when a panic yep. happens and COVID happens and we can no longer meet in person, what is a church? And a lot of pastors are just, yeah, you're the youth minister, figure it out. What are you going to do? You're, you're the director of this figure, do, you know, come up with something smart to do. And sometimes it's from a place where they feel like, well, who am I to say it? I don't know youth ministry. They know it better, but that's where organizational health comes in. We can all sit around the table and, and have that hard question where we say, what is a parish right now? Like, what is the vision of our church? Because yes. every action, everything we're doing, putting out content, anything is is a direct result of what we believe a parish should be. And if you just let everyone make up their minds, you don't have that cohesion of vision of the parish staff and the parish, the community. And a lot of, and, and we, we, we talked about it on a lot of episodes is, 
a lot of conservatives think that just having the true presence of Jesus in the Holy Sacrament of the Mass is enough, and that's all you ever need in a parish. Yeah. It's like the parish, that, that should, like I said in the last episode, everything should lead to that. But if you don't have a pathway to get there, you don't have, like you said, parish health in parish life and community, there's no way to get there. Yeah, and the church yeah. will literally implode well, on itself. Yeah. People won't know. People will be like your son and go, this is a trick. Yeah. <laughs> like, what yeah. Because they, they, they don't understand. Yeah. If you have to give them that like you're saying, that healthy culture so they can then grow deeper in that faith. And, the, the, and I think that you, you're... Go ahead, yeah. No, 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 go, go. Sorry, I've My only point much. was I was going to say, I think that you're... You talking about people need to come together and have these discussions. Yeah. Because I have I've know a lot of friends, a lot of parishes that are basically something hit, COVID, whatever it may be, and it goes... Okay, well, everybody just handle your ministry, and yep. uh, we'll all gather when this is over. Yep. And there's no communication. There's no support. Nobody knows what's going on. Yeah. And it kind of lands on one person. And in my parish, it's been me and, and kind of a crew that I've put together of that's going to each ministry and be like, how can we help you with this? How can we help you with your online presence? How can we help you with your audio presence? Yeah. How can we help you with whatever you need to do? And there's no... Not everyone's not working together. Yeah, yeah. So and, and the, and I, the other, I really agree with that. Yeah, and then the other problem is like then you start dying the death of a thousand good ideas, right? So it's just like whatever good idea comes across, you know, the pastor's desk, it's like, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. And then like someone else, you know, like, I mean, it, and it's not, again, I'm not saying this to say anyone's bad intentioned. It's just um, that lack of like that organizational health that has a process for how those decisions get mm -hmm. made, you know. Um, you know what? I'm I I'm going to say something to uh, not not to counter that, but uh, where I've seen fruit in my personal parish right now, because my my pastor is actually business savvy. He was a business major in college before he became a priest, so he has that business mindset to him. But where he was bogged down, honestly, was in too many meetings, too many committees. Yeah, the liturgy committee, the the parish council meetings, the the finance councils, and essentially nothing got done because a lot of the people that were on those councils were like 70 plus years old who were stuck in their ways. We've always been doing it this way. So we're going to continue to do it this yep, way. Yep. Well, maybe there's a better way, but no one. And so we, it was just like bogged down. Right. And so during COVID all those, they haven't been disbanded, but none of those things have been meeting only the, the finance council. Cause we had actually course, like, yeah. raise, we had to get money for uh, video cameras and stuff, but essentially like it's been myself and my pastor making, all the major decisions for the church. Yeah. And we get, we have gotten so much done in these five months or however long we've been doing this yeah. because we just have an idea and we run with it. Well, and not if it's to something be, that's expensive, they got to run it through the finance council, but we well, just do. Well, and not to be, you know, an amazing parish spokesperson here, but uh, that that's part of their model is like, you have the leadership team. The leadership team is a group of people that father wants to have that meeting with. And right now it's just you and him. Right. But like father can pick his three or four people and say, here's where we're going to come together. We're going to trust each other. We're going to say the hard things. We're going to say the things to our pastor that other people are afraid to say. We're going to, we're going to have mm -hmm. conflict, good conflict, ideological conflict. And then that can, that vision can trickle down to the rest of the staff because the whole staff doesn't have to be present to talk about, are we going to go live streaming or not? Right. So like, Absolutely. like that's exactly it is. I think pastors, um, learning how to lead out of a team like that is it yeah. frees right. them up they have less meetings they have less they can they can entrust those people to then go out and lead from that and they don't have to be at all the meetings they don't have to like everyone yes, wants yes. to meet with father right and and what pat lencioni and amazing parish talks about all the time is like it's so beautiful when a pastor can trust someone enough that then he can say look like go make those decisions you know you know my heart you know my vision now go like do this you know and then back to your original point, then the pastors, the priests can focus on giving the Past sacraments, yes, which the is where, where their passion is. Because I think yeah. a lot of these priests, and I don't want to speak for any of them, but I, I think many priests sometimes their their priesthood loses its flame a little bit when they get bogged down with meetings and business and paperwork and they're not the focus isn't them doing the sacraments is what yeah. they want to do yeah. and i yeah. think cuz and i'll speak my pastor loves the sacraments it's 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 and he he loves mass he loves sitting in confession he and it's so great and he's really leaned on a lot of us a very small core group of us since all this happened he says you guys take care of it when people come and ask him questions he'll say go ask danny he'll tell you what to, he'll tell that's you smart. and he'll talk that's so smart. he'll talk to me and then you you talk to him and he'll talk to me yeah that's smart and uh you know and and he's and he's been able to focus on how can i bring the sacraments during this difficult time 
let my team figure out the logistics. I'll worry about the sacrament. Yeah, it's and been look, really, and, really and, fruitful. And look, you know, like, you know, if a bishop listens to this, I know you have a lot of bishops that listen to your podcast, but, you know, we're not saying that we're taking away. <laughs> Tons. The, we, we're not saying that we're taking away the canonical right of the pastor to pastor and govern his parish. What we're saying is that, you know, Steve Jobs is not at every single, when he was alive, God exactly. rest his soul. He wasn't at every single meeting. He had a structure for how the vision like trickled down right right and so it's to support him exactly you, it's providing support so that he can trust so, yeah his people so, he's still the t head honcho so, so my my hope is that that what i was talking about you know we've gotten a lot done with just me and my pastor but yes there should be more people who have more input but the the old committees they weren't getting it done because it was so many old mindsets uh i won't say old people but maybe seasoned yeah. people that have yeah. been around a while right seasoned. so but nice. during covid so many churches have been they like it or not they've been thrust into this digital era yeah. catholic churches has been has been behind the curve by a lot when it comes comes to uh, catching up with technology. Yeah. Now, every church has, pretty much every church, I don't know any that have not, at least tried their, their hand at live streaming, whether it's just from a phone or not. But they've, they've gotten into this modern world in some way, shape, or form. So I'm hoping that this changes the mindset and we can help move forward in, in all sorts of parish life activities, ministries, committees, yes. so that we can refresh those ministries that are so... You well, know, stuck. And again, it comes down to a vision thing, because what I love about this tension of COVID is suddenly every parish is in the content game. Right. And and not I mean, there's a whole other conversation to be had about the fact that, like, if, if churches just stay making content, I mean, we're not the church then we're a media company. Right. So, like, we right. have to be out serving the poor and helping them and being the church. But what I love about this, like, suddenly every church is going, holy crap our live stream has to compete with the Vatican's live stream. Like when in a world where someone could go to, could go online and participate in any Catholic church or any other church, um, suddenly the question is, man, we like we've reached peak Catholic content in terms of catechetical instructional content, right? So like, how do I compete with drone footage of Father Dave Pavanka walking in a desert? Like. I can't compete with that as a church, right? What I can compete with is to bring it all back around because I'm the best guest of the year to bring it back around to, <laughs> to the incarnational, like your, our parish podcast is the only podcast that's going to talk about St. Francis in grapevine. There's no other Catholic podcast. I mean, maybe there are now, but there's no other Catholic podcast that like your parish doesn't have to compete with the best instructional stuff. Your the content we should be thinking about how do we show people our community? Like how do we have a conversation yes. and share our our local specific? That's what the parish is. Parish is it comes from this word meaning to sojourn with to journey with others. And so when we're getting Look, you guys, the, you guys think you're never going to learn on two Catholic dudes podcast. <laughs> there you go. There's, there you go. there's your, there's your for the word day. of the day. Yeah. So, I mean, we, <laughs> I, I think like people shouldn't be seeing all of your high quality or all of our high quality stuff and go, Oh man, we got to dump so much money into make the, like, like I would listen to if, if uh, mother Teresa had some shaky cam footage from a crappy iPhone mm -hmm. where she's like talking into the camera, I would watch it. I, I, yeah, I, of course. It could be in 720p, man. I'd watch that crap, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's three, 340 quality or whatever, potato quality. I yeah, so, so I would encourage, like, <laughs> priests and people that work at parishes and youth ministers, don't worry about, like, you have to teach so much and make it so engaging that way. Like, give your – share your witness, your testimony. Like, share your experience of what's going on. Well, just to speak truth on exactly what you're saying, when we started live streaming, I went to my pastor and said, we need to live stream. And his answer to me was, you know, there's they could watch Bishop Barron. They could watch Father Mike. They could watch the Pope Francis. They could watch all other masses. It's not that big of a deal. Dude, you're going back to my point from and, earlier. Go and ahead, I go pestered, ahead. And I pestered and pestered and pestered him. I said, our, pa our, pre our parishioners want their shepherd, yeah. want their pastor. That's yeah. what I was and talking about before, kid, yes. Kids, the... the, the the people were like, yes, when he finally started doing it. Yeah, he right. was, okay, let's do it. It was started with me and him in a phone. Yeah. Just in the chapel, me and him, one-on-one. -on -one. It was very awkward. It was uncomfortable. But the people of the parish 
loved it. Yeah, they that's, love it. That's it's authentic. His, yeah, because because you know what? If we want to get our fix of very attractive uh, priests, we'll go watch some Father Mike Schmidt's videos, and we'll be done. <laughs> but like you know, he's he's very eloquent. You know, it's a, the nice camera, all this stuff. But but yeah, they want their priest, and so I, yes, I've heard of some their community. I've heard of some pastors who like right before mass on the live stream and right after mass, they'll just say like, "Hey, here's what's going on. Here's what's been going on in my week. Like here, you know, like hope you guys are doing yeah. well. What about the?" And that's what people. That's what people really want. There's a book called uh, Made to Stick that tells the story of a small newspaper that reached in this very small city. It reached like 105 percent um, saturation in their market, which meant that in the market that they were trying to get people to buy this newspaper, they had more than the, they had more people buying their paper than lived in their market. And that's wow. because that's they they reached it because literally his whole take was names 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 like I, he said if i could print the the phone book in our newspaper i would because people want to see their names they want to see people they know they 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 read through it for the names so any picture any yeah. excuse they had to make their newspaper hyper local they would do it and people wanted to like the, oh that's so and so i know them or there's my name in there at this or there's you know susan from down the street in this paper right. because it reflected them yeah that's, i couldn't agree more so all those points go back to what i was talking about before so yeah like you said we could watch the vatican you could watch bishop Barron, but people want to see their their parish their pastor their yeah. priest yeah. right yeah. just like you wanted to be scott hahn but know what god <laughs> said you are eddie mitchell yeah. right, going back to that point here here i'm going to make this uh, uh we have almost an hour right now and we were talking about earlier, we don't want to put our show in a box in terms of a time limit, but I think because this conversation is flowing so much, we could go up for four hours, but I don't know how many people are going to sit through a four hour podcast. I would love to <laughs> do mom, another, uh, if, uh, yeah, our mom, my, my, my mom would hundred percent listen the whole way through. <laughs> yeah. She is the most dedicated, caring fan there. We'd is. have three sets of parents listen. Everybody else would tune out after 20 minutes. So I think it would be fruitful if we stopped under an hour right now. And, uh, yeah. I would love to have you back on yeah, a future I, it's episode. Actually, it's mandatory. Episodes. You have to come back. As guest of the year, I am happy to come <laughs> on again and again. And, uh, I got to have you guys to come on, uh, my show as well. You guys got to come out to Grapevine. Yeah. I think that'd be awesome, dude. Yes, dude. Yeah, come we, in we got we got to. Yeah, come in person. We show you the whole the whole setup and everything. And then uh, I was yeah. tell, Ryan. I was telling Danny, come out and record a bunch of episodes of your show out here while you're here. You know, yeah. like because you're yeah, saying yeah. you know Absolutely. some people. Yeah. So I, our, the next episode, I want to get into like how you got this space and set it up and everything. That's a whole other uh, set of topics right there. But we have four minutes left. I, okay. We always ask this last question. You can do it briefly since we're running out of time. Okay. What's your favorite board game? Or tabletop think, game or something of the sort. I think I'd have to say Settlers of Dude C Catan or is it Catan? Yeah, sure. C uh, it's, we say Catan. We, say Catan. Okay, we I used say to Catan. play it every week. We used to have a night once a week where we'd play that game. I hate though yeah. that my wife my wife is so much better than me at that game and it makes me really frustrated. Dude, if you like Settlers of Catan, check out Terra Mystica. We started with Settlers okay. of Catan. We moved on to this game called Terra Mystica. Yeah. Super nerdy, way nerdier than Settlers they of Catan. They made it in like Norway. Yeah, uh, it is, but it takes out the luck from Dude, Settlers I, of Catan. I'm so. the worst when it comes to board games because like my wife and I just fight a lot. I, I'm so mad. She is the best at Scrabble and I just feel like I'm smarter than her. I feel like I should be able to, <laughs> I feel like I should be able to beat her and she beats me every single time and she rubs oh it my in my gosh. face. All yeah. right, so when we come out, we're going to have a Settlers Night. I'll teach you Terra Mystica. It's okay. going to be crazy. All right, so awesome. where can they find you? Anyone that's listening, Edmund, where can they find you on social media? How can they listen to your stuff? If you just search my name, Edmund Mitchell, Edmund with a U. Um, we'll make sure to place, tag it in the comments. Yeah, and then, you know, there's the show with Edmund Mitchell, which is a show about nothing, and then there's Catholic Admin. I don't know, just my name. Just find Just Ed, go Edmund, below. Yeah, EdmundMitchell.com. Look, look below in the comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah, hey, if dude. you're listening, though, if you're only hey. listening. So, yeah, edmundmitchell.com. On Instagram, you have a lot of stuff on Instagram. We'll make sure to tag you in all the Instagram promotion. And, guys, Again, if Edmund, you're listening this has in been the amazing. comments, you got to set, you got to vote below that guest of the year. Bring the belt. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> dude, Danny has belts. He's I a have, wrestling I have belts. Let's I have wrestling belts. We'll, all right. We'll send it out to the guest of the year. Absolutely. All right. All right. We're, we're running out of time. Okay. This this conversation is to be continued. But it's This has been amazing. Edmund, so thank great. you so much for being oh, on. We had a blast, guys. man. Dude, thank you, guys. I was, so I was so nervous to come on, so thanks for having me. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. All right, everybody, thanks again. We will see you next time, next Monday. Uh, we'll catch you later. That's it. Peace. Peace.